I need to have a conversation actually. Since uh, let me just, you guys happy to participate? <laughs> you can use this one too, right? Okay. Okay. So we can uh, we can make a conversation. Okay. Should we uh, kick off? Yeah. Cool. Hi, uh, and everybody at home. I'm Jordi. Um, I'm a strategic advisor to Mantle, which is a layer two to Mystic Rollup that's starting soon. And uh, you know, one of the more fun things I have in my job is to evaluate projects and kind of decide which we want to invest in, which we want to support. And obviously, stable coins are a very large part of the ecosystem and the DeFi uh, um, kind of world right now. So I wanted to give some of my thoughts and anecdotes on projects we're talking about, what I look for, what I want to not see in projects. Um, so yeah, a little background about myself. I've kind of started thinking about stable coins during the DeFi summer. Obviously, it was a crazy time, Wild West. We had rug pulls going on. We have uh, People thinking they can just be like market makers and you know going into Uniswap pools and, and trying to farm stuff, which was working great for a while. So I kind of found myself in uh, in 21 and then 22 in in the middle of the peak mania. So first we had uh, Olympus DAO, which was you know claiming to be a decentralized stable, not exactly a stable coin. <laughs> it was a variable coin that. Um, was supposed to be backed so by a treasury and uh you know I, I looked at the game theory behind this my background is in game theory and kind of realized that you know this is a nice diagram with uh, the three three and, and all this stuff but actually uh there's some holes and, and doesn't fully really work and then uh you know i really got into thinking about these problems as luna was kind of going up and there was this uh, infamous debate i had a few weeks before it collapsed um, on Bankless, where you know, kind of talking uh, about some of the issues potentially with Luna, and and that kind of really got me thinking about uh, you know what what are the issues that arise. So you know, doing a thought experiment about stable coins and, and what are the things that you definitely do not want to see that we found. So on the left, this is kind of like a simplification of what Olympus DAO actually was. It was basically not thinking about the exit plan, just the entry plan. So, you know, we're all gonna go in, we're gonna put our money in, we're gonna keep buying, and this thing's gonna go up, and we're all gonna be rich. And the reason people are gonna, all gonna be rich is because there is a market price, but no one's thinking about exiting. And if everyone's exiting, you don't actually get that market price. So it's, it's easy to think that you have something valuable just because you've made it have a certain price without thinking about the liquidity. Um, so you have to be very careful with these game theory dynamics and not creating liquidity traps. And then the other one you want to avoid is moral hazards. Moral hazard is, you know, things like FTX, things like, you know, other things we saw last cycle where it's, you know, tails I win, heads you lose. There is a party that has the upside but doesn't actually participate in the risk. And they're incentivizing and marketing and, and really kind of pushing and promoting. But if things go wrong, there's somebody else holding the bag. So these examples we've seen numerous of so uh yeah before i go to the next slide like talking about luna um this was a complex one a lot of people were debating about it what is what is working about it what's not working about it and then ultimately it did fail even when it failed few people were really understanding why it failed i think there was a lot of uh, attention on anchor as being the culprit oh this yield is 20 percent, and this is the problem but actually the yield of Anchor wasn't actually causing the collapse of Luna. The collapse of Luna was more systemic and was unavoidable regardless of Anchor. Um, I don't know if anybody like had any experience of thinking through Luna as that, as that happened or even after. Was anybody in Luna? Any UST? No, okay, one person had UST. Okay, two, okay. <laughs> Few people had UST. So, um, now that you look back, like, does, does anybody have a, if, if somebody asks you guys, like, okay, you, 
you know, Luna blew up, UST didn't, it depegged. What would you say is the reason that it depegged? Like somebody comes and says, oh, what happened? What is it? Someone said it depegged. Well, it, it did because you can't get your money back, you know, if you put in a certain amount. But did, did, did we really like understand why there was a liability mismatch? Like, would you, would you have any explanation for it? Okay, the yield looked good. The yield looked good, fair enough. So what happened with Luna ultimately, you know, even after that disaster happened, it took me kind of weeks to really process and digest and, and explain. And um, ultimately Luna, the problem with USD is it tried to become base money. So when I see stable coins or any kind of crypto trying to create a new currency that is creating seigniorage. So seigniorage means someone is getting rich out of thin air. So in Luna's example, you know, you could just print this stable coin and it's stable until somebody else sells enough of it that it breaks the peg. So Luna made the mistake of trying to be base money. So whenever I see base money, if it's not gold backed, if it's not actually gold, which is, you know, a good kind of base money, this is like red alarm right away. Um, so, you know, Olympus DAO is another example of trying to tell people this is a currency and we're going to create it in a certain way. In Luna's example, the people that were making money from UST were people who bought Luna very cheap and then wrote it up. So imagine you're a seed investor in Luna and you bought it at 20 cents and then suddenly Luna's worth $100. You can take your Luna and change it for $100 worth of UST. You just made $98 and, and eight, 90 cents out of, out of thin air that when you exit it into USDC or USDT, somebody has to pay that. And you're kind of playing God in a way. You're just deciding I'm, I'm just making this money. So the investors of Luna were actually creating base money and this was not sustainable. So this is something, uh, you know, red flag, don't be base money. R rule number one. So the dollar, <laughs> that's an amazing question. Uh, so two things to say about that. One, if people bring up the dollar and they bring it up in a context of, well, the dollar is not backed by anything, so my shitcoin can equally be the same and it's the same category, that doesn't cut it. Like, yes, the dollar has a problem and I think it will continue to devalue and it has issues and fiat currency generally is mismanaged, but it doesn't mean that, you know, Mr. Uh, you know, pseudonymous founder founding a coin can have the nuclear bombs and the tanks and weapons of the US dollar and the economy of the US dollar. It doesn't. It's the military power, right? So, you know, the Anon with the, the monkey PFP is, is probably not going to have that. Um, so the second thing, and, and, and you talked about yield, you know, you saw the yield. I, you know, if I, if I see a coin, a stable coin trying to create yield, I'm immediately going into like, you know, how does this go into the future? Is this sustainable? So there's different kinds of yield. You know, the, the more like safe one you could say is like uh, things like money market funds and we're starting to see those. So those are great. I think USDC, USDT, they don't actually give you any of the yield. It's the companies that are making billions of dollars, right? Like Tether is announcing like a billion dollars a quarter. Circle is doing very well. This is like a great environment. The users are not getting anything and you're just getting devalued. So now there is, projects that are looking to bring those on chain. Now there's, there's two types. There's the ones that are going to the government and getting KYC and you know, everything is very carefully done. And then there's kind of more like decentralized MakerDAO style where there's an intermediary that does it for you. So I think these are very interesting and they actually give the user an opportunity to participate in the money market of the fiat currency, you know, dirty fiat yield, central bank money. Another type is native staking yield. The staking yield. The issue with uh, the staking yield is that it's variable, right? You have a variable coin. You have Ethereum, stake the ETH four or five percent. You can use that. Then you have to short an equivalent, uh, you know, version of the long with a short. So there's a bunch of coins right now. I think LST Fi is is very popular. I don't have a strong opinion on uh, you know whether it's good or not, but it, it's a trend that we're seeing. 
We've seen it before. The problem is you do have to put on the short as well as the long. So if the stable coin is long staked ETH, you have to go to a derivative and short, short ETH, right, to, to create the balance. Um, there's people thinking through this problem, and some solutions are good, some are not good. The problem is the second part. If you're shorting a future, you don't actually know what the yield is. So the yield can be positive, the yield can be negative. If, you're, if you've ever traded per perpetuals, every eight hours the funding changes, and you don't know what it's going to be. And the problem with these things potentially is like they don't scale. As more and more people short the future, there's an imbalance and the yield goes negative. So you can have 4% on the ETH and you might have minus 10% on, on the shorting derivative. So you end up with negative yield, which is a bad, bad outcome. So uh, I'm very careful about uh, thinking through these things. It's not as bad as this guy right here. I don't know. Like back, uh, back when the Olympus forks were, were kind of wild, you start seeing like 300,000 APY, 79,000. It's a bit more than the 7%. And, you know, this stuff is, is going into, like, the monkey brain, and it's trying to make you think, like, well, even if it goes down 50%, I'm going to make 300,000%, so it's still a good deal, which, of course, you know, it doesn't actually even make it past, like, a few days sometimes if it's, if it's like, so crazy. Um, another type of yield, you know, Curve ETH, these type of Curve USD, these type of things where you're getting in essence, trading fees or some kind of protocol fees. Um, these are fine in a way, like they're a sustainable yield, but you are getting multiple risks. So you might be exposed to three stable coins instead of one. And if any of them depegs, then you're, you're liable, right? Because the pool is going to get imbalanced. So risk to know. And then finally, yeah, like so what we saw in DeFi Summer where you just have incentives. Um, now, there's times where it's okay. Like, FRAX is an interesting situation because they are incentivizing, um, bootstrapping their ecosystem. And in a way, you're participating, you're getting some yield. So that's okay. But as these things start to go to infinity, uh, they become less sustainable. So red flags for me is like, is it just incentives that make sense within the ecosystem? Or is it something that is like way out of proportion? So... Uh, Another thing that immediately is coming to my head. Okay, you, you've created a stable coin. You've, can't, you've come to me. You want $20 million. What exactly are you trying to solve? Like, are you trying to play a Ponzi game and trying to present yield as a savings account? Are you trying to give people an opportunity to just put money, get yield, and is that safe? Uh, are you trying to use it for transfers and you're trying to create money in the sense of transaction? So between you know, two parties that want to pay each other, is this what you're trying to do? In which case you need, you know, cheap transfers, you need potentially the cross-chain transfers, maybe off-rails, so like these types of things. Um, do you want to use it for collateral, right? So this is one useful way to use it. You, you get your stable coin and then you, you do trading with it. You're basically going to a third party and you're saying, look, I have money, I have this stable coin that, that allows me a certain amount of credit into your casino into your protocol, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, and, you know, finally, the most important rule, are you going to stay stable? So we have like uh, Louis C.K., which is like, yeah, of course, of course this thing is going to stay stable. But maybe, and you have, to, you have to think about the maybe, because ultimately, extreme events happen all the time in crypto. Like we think it's one out of a blue moon. We think it's like a Six Sigma event, but these things seem to happen all the time, right? So. Uh, first of all, like, is there liquidity for people to exit en masse? Because when it rains, it pours. Everybody wants to exit at the same time. We saw that last year. You know, 3AC had stake ETH, and stake ETH is, is a good product, right? Like, it's, it's not a scam or anything. But everybody wanted to exit at the same time. You have, like, uh, huge amounts of demand and, and no supply for, for exiting. So you have to think through uh, the exit rails. And then, you know, the more interesting part, so with algorithmic stable coins that are not one-to-one -one with a bank account, like a circle, you usually have backing. You need backing. I, I don't think it's possible to have non-backing because then, you know, we get back to base money, which we don't want to do. But if you have backing, there's two types of backing. There's stable coin backing. But this doesn't make any sense, right? So we saw this with DAI. You get USDC and then you give people DAI. And does it, what, are you, what have you achieved? Like you have the equal product and it's the same risk. Or you have variable. So variable is fine, it's good. 
The problem with variable, uh, sometimes assets are moving and they can move below the threshold at which you're backing. So, you know, synthetics is an example where they're very conservative. They have the ratio to get synthetics USD, SUSD. It's like 400%. They've increased it from 200, three, four, it's like four, 500% that you need to have. But synthetics is, uh, you know, it's a DeFi coin and these things can go up and down 90%. So ultimately there is still a risk <laughs> even with 500% backing. Now Ethereum maybe is not gonna go down 90%. You know, maybe it'll go down 20, 30, 40% and you, you have a bit more space. Um, so what I like to see is like, are you trying to liquidate people? If you are like MakerDAO, uh, how are you doing the liquidation? Is it, is it a fair liquidation? Are, are users getting hurt? And uh, you know, the most exciting thing that I'm looking forward to as the next development of stable coins is having a version of variable coins being backing without liquidations. So what does it mean? So uh, if the coin drops a lot in value, you wanna have a third counterpart be able to backstop and fill it back up. So why would they do it? They need to have an incentive. So we've seen uh, in DeFi, for example, vaults, like Ribbon, these types of like options vaults. What they essentially do is do a covered call. So you say, okay, I have some Ethereum. The price is $2,000. I just want to get 10% yield. So I just want to have $2,200 next time. If the price goes up, I understand that you know, I'm gonna have less Ethereum, but I'm still gonna get the yield. So in essence, a covered call is a way to give upside. How does it relate to stable coins? It's the opposite. So you have uh, a put that essentially somebody is underwriting. So I tell you, okay, you have a backing, whether it's Ethereum or something else. If the price goes below the backing, I will step in and fill back the reserve so that people can still exit. And in exchange, I need some yield, or potentially I need to get a covered call. So I'm getting the upside if, if the thing goes up, if the variable thing goes up, I get the upside and I'll cover your downside. These types of designs I think are the next iteration for creating a backed stable coin. And this is the kind of stuff on Mantle that we're working on we're hoping to see. And uh, yeah, I think this is the next evolution. So happy to take any questions uh, on any topic that we discussed or any comments. Any thoughts? <laughs> it's just a sad comment that there are so many projects. Yes. Uh, also, there are many more stable coin ideas and projects That's than a lot. people using it for, I mean, payments for instance. That's true. But we have that in NFTs as well, where you have infinite NFT projects and then ultimately just a few really catch on and, and make enough. And e even at this like cool summit, there's a lot of people thinking about these these problems. I talked to five different people and three of them actually might have the same idea. Especially right now, a lot of a lot of them come back to the uh, you know stake thief, long stake thief, use that yield and short it somewhere else. And you know there's different approaches on how you short it. You're right, there's a lot of options. They're slightly different. Each one is slightly different. I think some will be maybe better at some of the details. Hopefully it's not just about marketing because that's what, I mean, Do Kwon was an incredible marketer. Uh, he really made a huge success out of something that should not have been a success because of how good he was at you know, talking and creating partnerships. So hopefully we've learned a lesson and, and next time the, the winners will be the ones that have really gotten it right. Um, but yeah, a lot of ideas out there. So it's, it's a hot space, that's for sure. Any other thoughts? Cool, well thank you guys, thanks for coming. <laughs>